we are resuming Archbishop Averki's commentaries on the Holy Gospels. And we're up to the Lord repeats his prophecy of his imminent suffering and resurrection and answers the sons of Zebedee regarding primacy in his kingdom. And it reference, references three Gospels, starting with the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 20, verses 17, uh, 20, verses 17 to 28. And when Jesus went up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered up to the chief priests and scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him up to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he shall raise himself. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, making obeisance and asking something and asking something from him. And he said to her, what dost thou wish? She saith to him, Command that these two sons of mine might sit, one on thy right and one on thy left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask for yourselves. Are ye able to drink the cup which I am about to drink, and to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They say to him, We are able. And he saith to them, Ye shall indeed drink my cup, and be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to those for whom it hath been prepared by my father. And after the ten heard it, they were indignant on account of the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, Ye know that the rulers of the nations exercise lordship over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever doth wish to become great among you shall be your servant. And whosoever doth wish to be first among you shall be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And next, the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 10, verses 32 to 45. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was leading them forth, and they were astounded. And while they followed, they were afraid. And he took aside the twelve and began to tell them the things that were about to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered up to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and deliver him up to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him and scourge him and spit upon him and kill him, and on the third day he shall raise himself. And Jacobus and John, the sons of Zebedee, go to him, saying, Teacher, we wish that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall ask. And he said to them, What do ye wish for me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant to us that we might sit, one on thy right and one on thy left, in thy glory. But Jesus said to them, Ye know not what ye ask for yourselves. Are ye able to drink the cup that I drink, and to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup indeed that I drink, ye shall drink, and the baptism with which I am baptized, ye shall be baptized. But to sit on my right and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to those for whom it hath been prepared. And after the ten heard it, they began to be indignant on account of Jacobus and John. But Jesus called them to himself and saith to them, Ye know that those who are accounted to rule over the nations exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Uh, yet it shall not be so among you, but whosoever doth wish to become great among you shall be your servant, and whosoever doth wish to become first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And then finally, the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 18, verses 31 to 34. Then, having taken along with himself the twelve, he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which have been written by the prophets regarding the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered up to the Gentiles, and shall be mocked and insulted and spat upon. And after they scourge him, they shall kill him, and on the third day he shall raise himself. And they understood none, none of these things. And this saying was hidden from them, and they were not perceiving the things being said. And this is Archbishop of Erki. All three synoptics agree that the Lord on the way to Jerusalem once again began to speak to the disciples about his forthcoming suffering, death and resurrection. 
St. Mark's account is most detailed and vivid since he heard it since he heard it all firsthand from the Apostle Peter. He said that the Lord walked ahead evidently as one going to his own suffering willingly, desiring to accomplish the will of God. Compare with compare compare this with Luke twelve fifty. His disciples, however, still burdened with human reasoning, were thinking only of the earthly glory of the Messiah, and they were amazed, and as they and as they followed they were afraid. Having called the twelve to himself, apparently because they, there was a multitude walking with him, the Lord told them about everything that would occur in Jerusalem, everything the prophets wrote about him, that he would be submitted to mocking, condemned to death, and given to the Gentiles, i.e. the Romans, who, after beating him and mocking him, would kill him, and on the third day he would be raised up. St. Luke adds that the disciples understood nothing, for the meaning of his words was hidden from them. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to the Lord with her sons James and John, see Mark's account, with a request to place one of her sons at the right hand and the other at the left hand of his kingdom. In other words, she was asking her sons to be second and third in importance after him in the messianic kingdom. But the Lord answered, you do not know what you ask. Truly, the apostles did not know that primacy in his kingdom meant primacy in self-denial and martyrdom in the name of Christ. They thought that they were only asking for uh, for honours, power and joy. Therefore, the Lord indicates with his question, are you able to drink the cup that I drink, that being near him in the kingdom will mean emulating him in suffering? Sufferings here are spoken of as a cup that Christ's near ones must share with him. This image is meant to echo the cup of poison that King sent condemned men to drink. The Son of God is depicted in the Gospels as a man condemned, to whom the Father in heaven sends a cup of death, and be baptized with ba and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. This is an expression of the same thought. Bearing sufferings is, is imagined as a full immersion in water. The apostles answered in the affirmative. Saint John Chrysostom says that says they spoke in the fire of zeal, not knowing what they said. They said the same thing that all the disciples were saying when they promised to follow the Lord even unto death. You will indeed drink the cup that I drink. It is as if the Lord is saying, even though you promise without thinking, but truly in the future you will be like me in bearing your labours patiently. As for the one sitting on my right hand in this kingdom, which you imagine to be earthly, it is not mine to give, but is prepared by my Father. This means that it is not in Christ's authority to give this to whomsoever desires it, but only to those for whom these places were prepared, who will have deserved them through their labours. The rest of the apostles were angry, evidently envious of the brothers. The Lord then gives them all instruction, telling them not to, not to seek to be first. In answer to their nascent ambition, and sorry, I just want to look up what this word means, nascent, especially of a process or organization, just coming into existence and beginning to display signs of future potential, the nascent space industry, okay? In answer to their nascent ambition, the Lord teaches them that the essential rule of the morality of the members of his kingdom, unlike kingdoms of this world, is humility and self-denial. As an example of such humility and self-denial, the Lord gives the apostles himself. He came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Here he says, many instead of all. All people were in spiritual bondage to the devil and worked for sin. In order to free them, it was necessary to buy, to quote, buy them out, to give ransom. Uh, the Lord pays this price, this redemption, with the price of his passion and death on the cross. Um, Saint, in St. Luke's account, that's what it said that, I think it said that the, the apostles didn't understand the Lord's words. Um, and we see this quite a lot, that the, the apostles are not, uh during the gospel they're not the same apostles or they are the same apostles but they're not the same in terms of like their level of discernment of of wisdom of um ability to 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 do the the will of god as they went on to become um and i'm wondering what we should take away from that, that as they were starting their life as Christians, they were like this and, and how they went on to become and how they ultimately um, met their repose.
um, knowledge of what the kingdom of God really was um, comes slowly even to the apostles. Uh, the church has not been founded like it was on the day of Pentecost. And these scenes from the gospel are even before Christ's passion, as most of the gospel is. And so the, the apostles didn't have a very clear view of what their assignment was. And you can see the different ones come out with um, different statements uh, that shows how much their understanding at the time. Peter is perhaps the most enlightened when he says, thou art the son of God, when they ask, when uh, our Lord Jesus Christ asks, who do people say that I am? But then again, we see his weakness when he des denies Christ later on. So we have to look at them as being in the process. Also, the sons of Zebedee that we spoke about, um, we shouldn't look at them as all different from ourselves. Uh, we want things, but we don't want to pay the price for them. In other words, uh, even today, Christians want the gifts of God, but they don't want to pay that price that comes with the gifts of God. Uh, the gifts of God are not just dished out um, and we are going to be rewarded with something good. We have to, as the fathers say, um, give blood in order to receive spirit. Uh, thank you, Vespada. This next section is called Healing the Two Blind Men in Jericho, and it references the first three Gospels, starting with the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 20, verses 29 to 34. And as they went forth from Jericho, a great crowd followed him, and behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside after they heard after they heard Jesus' passing by cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. And the crowd rebuked them that they should be silent. But they kept on crying out the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do ye, what do ye wish that I should do to you? And they say to him, Lord, that our eyes might be opened. And Jesus was moved with compassion and touched their eyes, and straightway their eyes recovered sight, and they followed him. And then next, the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. And they come to Jericho, and as he went out from Jericho, and his disciples, and a considerable crowd, Bartimaeus the blind man, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the wayside begging. And having heard, and having heard, it is Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and to say, Son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. And many were rebuking him in order that he should keep silent. But he kept on crying out much more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good courage, arise, he calleth thee. And he, having cast off his outer garment, rose up and came to Jesus. Jesus answered, saying to him, What dost thou wish that I should do to thee? And the blind man said to him, Rabuni, that I might recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee well. And straightway he recovered his sight and followed Jesus on the way. And then finally, the Gospel of St. Luke chapter 18 verses 35 to 43 and it came to pass as he was drawing near to jericho a certain blind man was sitting by the wayside begging and having heard a crowd passing by he kept on inquiring what this may be and they related to him jesus the nazarene is passing by and he called out saying jesus son of david have mercy on me and they who went before were rebuking him in order that he should keep silent but he kept on crying out much more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And after he drew near, he asked him, saying, What dost thou wish that I should do to thee? And he said, Lord, that I might recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Recover thy sight, thy faith hath made thee well. And immediately he recovered his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And all the people, having seen it, gave praise to God. And this is Archbishop Averki. 
Jericho was a large city during that time, important for its historical memory. Not far from there, the Jews miraculously crossed the Jordan when they came from Egypt. This was the first city that the Hebrews took, uh, took miraculously. Here also were situated the schools of the prophets. Here Elisha performed the miracle of making the bitter waters sweet. The surrounding area is remarkable for its greenery and wonderful climate, but closer to Jerusalem there was a forlorn, rocky desert in which many wild animals and robbers lived. When the Lord was walking out of Jericho along the usual road from Galilee through Perea toward Jerusalem, many people followed him, many of whom were also going to Jerusalem for the feasts of Passover. There were two blind men by the wayside asking for alms, who began to shout, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. This exclamation was itself a witness of their living faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. The people tried to force them to remain silent, not to bother Jesus Christ, probably because Christ was teaching the masses at this moment. The Lord asked what they wanted from him and received the answer, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. He touched their eyes and healed them, after which they followed him. The three synoptics speak of this healing, but only St. Matthew speaks of two blind men. St. Mark and St. Luke mention only one, and St. Mark even gives a name, Bartimaeus, meaning son of Timaeus. It can be assumed that one of these blind men was, was well known, while the other was an unknown, unnoticed by many, which would explain why two of the evangelists do not mention him. One more difference between the accounts is that Matthew and Mark have Christ healing the man on the exit from Jericho, while St. Luke places it at his entry to Jericho. Bishop Michael interprets this apparent contradiction thus. The word St. Luke uses, uh, um, uh, ang ang means, not exactly, means not exactly enters, but is located near something. Consequently, it would be more correct to translate Luke to say that Jesus healed the man while near Jericho, whether at the entrance or exit, whether at the entrance or exit, it does not matter. And that's the end of this section. And again, did your grace have any thoughts to share? I can marvel at um, the healings of Christ and, and truly there, there's something marvelous. And this is, this are, actual miracles of Christ. Uh, but in order to go one step higher, we have to um, look at the spiritual meanings behind them. And the spiritual meanings is um, our spiritual vision that we all lack. We're all blind men. Uh, we're not all blind men physically, but spiritually we're all blind men. And um, we live in a society and more so today, I think, than any other time, when, when people want to really reach out and cry out to Christ, uh, the people around, like the Jews of that time, are telling them to be silent. In other words, don't seek this kind of, of healing. So we live in a society that tells us that um, Christians are fanatics, and uh, we don't... Uh, need to really seek that we what's needed in today's world is being uh, politically correct um, accepting everything uh, the gospel though the whole teaching of Christ is, is to find right from wrong uh, not that Christ's words are a simple moral rule uh, much the opposite uh, but to become Christ-like, what was Christ. And uh, so we're pushed upon by society to not um, raise ourselves up to a higher level, to a spiritual vision. Oh, thank you, Bespada. Did we have any thoughts or questions on this section? I just wondered this, but it, it, um, these two blind men were not waiting for Christ. They were they were there begging for alms. So how is it? How did they know that this was Christ? Did they just sense this was what was? You know, did the Holy Spirit touch them? What what caused them to know that uh, Christ was there? I mean, it could be like another gospel. Um situations where 
people ask what what was going on uh, because wherever Christ was, there were crowds following him. So they probably heard all this uh, noise and someone told them that it was Christ. But uh, it is interesting that um, they were seeking um, material things, but then when they learned that it was Christ, they immediately knew that they could um, ask for something spiritual. So uh, they did have enlightenment that um, Christ could work miracles, whereas everybody else could just give them some money. Okay, this next section is called The Lord Jesus Christ Visits Zacchaeus, and it references the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. And Jesus, having entered, was passing through Jericho. And behold, there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and this man was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd, for he was, for he was little of stature. And he ran in front and went up into a sycamore tree in order that he might see him, for he was about to pass through that way. And when Jesus came upon the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today it is needful for me to stay in thy house. And he, and he made haste and came down and received him rejoicing. But after they saw it, they were all murmuring, saying, With a sinful man he doth enter to lodge. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, the half of my possessions, Lord, I give to the poor. And if I exhorted anything of anyone by false charges, I give back fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today to this house salvation came to pass, inasmuch as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which had been lost. And this is Archbishop of Erkney. Only St. Only Saint Luke mentions this visit to the chief publican Zacchaeus. Having healed the blind men, the Lord went into Jericho, where a certain very rich man named Zacchaeus wanted to see him very much. This name is Jewish, meaning pure or righteous. Jericho was wealthy due to, due to its production and sale of balsam, and the collector of Jericho's taxes was an important man who was also very rich. Zacchaeus was not, a mere collect, was not a mere collector of tax, but the chief publican, to whom most likely the publicans of an entire district answered. The gospel underlines that he was a rich man. After all, so few rich men followed the poor Galilean teacher. Zacchaeus was short of stature, and so he climbed a fig tree in order to better see the Lord, who was surrounded by a crowd of people. Evidently knowing Zacchaeus's good moral disposition, his desire to see the Lord that was more than mere curiosity, the Lord honoured his house with a visit. The great joy that the Lord did not disdain him as a sinner finally awakened Zacchaeus's conscience, affecting a complete moral transformation in his soul. Admitting that his conscience was not clear with respect to the means he used to get rich, he gives a general pronouncement, a triumphant promise to expiate his sin of avarice. Look, uh, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold, all of which is the proper restitution according to the law in Exodus 22 verse 1. The Lord answered, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham, not only by descent, but according to the Spirit. The repentance of Zacchaeus is a model of true repentance that is not limited by a fruitless remorse over sins committed, but strives to expiate the sins through virtues that are the sins opposites. Therefore, the gospel reading concerning Zacchaeus is always read the week before the preparatory period for Lent begins, the week before the Sunday of the publican and the Pharisee. And that's the end of this section. And again, did your grace have any thoughts to share? First, I think it's um, for all of us a very um, touching um, scene in the gospel because except for all of us were on pilgrimage together in um, in October of last year to, what was it? No, it was November of last year um, to the Holy Land and we went to 
where what's left of the sycamorea tree is and we um, reflected on the meaning of that in the gospel Zacchaeus is um, uh, a tax collector and a head tax collector something already hated by the the Jews um, because they were Jews and collecting taxes from other Jews for the Romans which was enough of a reason for hatred but they're also uh, usually thieves in a sense that they had the power over um, a people that didn't know how to read for the most part to ask for as much taxes as they wanted and that just went uh, into their own uh, pocket and Zacchaeus comes to um, comes to repentance uh, when he sees Christ he struggles to see Christ because he goes up into this tree because he's short and he wants to see Christ at first but uh, Christ sees his desire and and, and Christ even uh, accepts to uh, enter his home uh, so it's about the repentance of a person how how great that is and Zacchaeus goes on to become a bishop of the church. Uh, just one thing. How important is uh, expiation, atonement, uh, other than repentance, to um, uh, take away our sin? This is a big um, difference between East and West in, in how we look at um, repentance and what atonement really is. Um, God does not um, have any price to forgive us from the moment that someone is going to say, I've sinned with all his heart, Christ has forgiven us. Uh, the movement thereafter to, um, to do good works is, is showing that you've really changed your life. It's not um, repaying exactly... Um, what we owe and and that's it because we owe all our lives to god we all we owe all our devotion to god all our love to god so repentance is a continuous practice um to not to repay something that we owe as atonement suggests uh but to live for god when before our life was for ourselves um for our selfishness as we can see in Zacchaeus also and suddenly um everything is for the glory of God thank you Vladika the whole thing, the whole thing of atonement is a very big chapter and it goes out to more things than just atonement for repentance it moves us into um uh, how man was reconciled with God um, through the death and resurrection of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, so we have to come to a more um, orthodox understanding of, of the whole matter of atonement um, as a change, a change of life. Uh, thank you, Vesper. Okay, we'll move on to the next section, which is called the parable of the 10 pounds or the talents. And it references two gospels. And uh, we're going to start with the gospel of St. Luke, chapter 19, verses 11 to 28. And as they heard these things, he added and spoke a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they thought that the kingdom of God was immediately about to be shown forth. He saith, therefore, a certain well-born man went into a far city. Uh, sorry, a certain well-born man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And having called his own ten slaves, he gave ten minas to them. And he said to them, and sorry, and said to them, transact business while I go and return. But his citizens kept on hating him, and sent forth an embassy after him, saying, We are unwilling for this man to reign over us. And it came to pass when he returned, having received the kingdom, that he commanded those slaves to be called to him, to whom he gave the money, in order that he might, in order that he might find 
out what each gained by trading. And the first came up saying, Lord, thy mina got, uh, gained ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because in a, because in a very little thou was faithful, be thou having authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Lord, thy mina made five minas. And he also, and he said also to this one, be thou also over five cities. And another came saying, Lord, behold thy mina, which I was keeping laid up in a napkin, for I was afraid of thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up what thou didst not lay down, and reapest what what thou didst not sow, and gatherest together where sorry, and gatherest together where thou didst not winnow. He saith to him, Out of thy mouth will I judge thee, O wicked slave. Thou knowest that I am an austere man, taking up what I did not lay down, and reaping what I did not sow, and gathering together where I did not winnow. And why didst thou not give my money to the bank? And indeed, after I came, I would have exacted payment from it with interest. And to those standing by, he said, Take away the minna from him, and give it to the one who had the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he hath ten minas. For I say to you that to every one who hath shall be given, for from the one who hath not, even what he hath shall be taken away from him. Moreover, those enemies of mine, the ones unwilling for me to reign over them, bring here and slaughter them before me. And having said these things, he was going ahead, ascending to Jerusalem. And then second, the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. For the kingdom of the heavens is even as a, as a man going abroad, who called his own slaves and delivered up to them his property. And to one indeed he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own strength. And straightway he went abroad. And the one who received the five talents went and traded with them, and made another five talents. And in like manner the one who received two, he also gained another two. But the one who received the one went away and dug in the earth and hid the money of his Lord. And after a long time, the Lord of those slaves cometh and settleth accounts with them. And the one who received the five talents came forward and brought and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, thou didst deliver up to me five talents. Behold, I gained another five talents above them. And his Lord said to him, Well done, O good and faithful slave. Over a little thou was faithful. I will appoint thee over much, enter into the joy of thy Lord. And also the one who received two talents said, Lord, thou didst deliver up to me two talents. Behold, I gained another two talents above them. And his Lord said to him, Well done, O good and faithful slave. Over a few things thou was faithful. I will appoint thee over much, enter into the joy of thy Lord. And also the one who received the one talent came forward and said, Lord, I have come to know that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou didst not sow, and gathering together from where thou didst not winnow. And I was afraid and went away and hid thy talent in the earth. Behold, thou hast thine own. And his Lord answered and said to him, O evil and reluctant slave, thou knewest that I reap where I did not sow, and gather together from, from where I did not winnow. Then it was needful for thee to have put my money to the bankers, and I should have received for myself mine own with interest. Take away then the talent from him, and give it to him who hath the ten talents. For to every one who hath, it shall be given, and he shall be in abundance. But from the one who hath not, even that which he hath, even that which he hath shall be taken away from him. And cast ye out the unprofitable slave into the darkness, the outer one. There shall be there the weeping and the gnashing of the teeth. And this is Archbishop of Erke. While still in Zacchaeus's house, the Lord began to tell the parable of the ten pounds, which has many similarities with St. Matthew's parable of the talents. While they, were, while they have many similarities, there are some essential differences as well. In addition, as we see in the Gospel of Matthew, the parable of the talents was told by the Lord much later in connection with his conversation regarding the second coming, the end of the world, and the final judgment. Nevertheless, the main idea of both parables is the same, and so we can discuss them in parallel. In the parable of the pounds, 
Christ speaks of a person of noble birth who travels to a distant country in order to come into his inherited kingdom, then returns home. This image is taken from the political reality of Palestine at that time. Local kings had to go directly to Rome in order to be confirmed in their royal dignity. Archelaus, son of Herod the Great, as well as Herod Antipas, Tetrarch of Galilee, both had to do this. In the parable of the talents, however, the protagonist is merely a man who leaves to a far country. In both parables, this person is an image of Christ who was supposed to, in the Hebrew consciousness, begin an earthly kingdom. In the parable of the pounds, the Lord gives 10 slaves 10 pounds, one pound per slave, ordering them to use the money to make profit. In the parable of the talents, the Lord gives his slaves all his possessions, giving each a portion according to his abilities. A talent was a solid piece of silver worth a significant amount of money. Of course, in both parables, the slaves are the disciples and followers of Christ who receive from the Lord various gifts and external good things, which they must multiply for the glory of God, for the benefit of their neighbors and the salvation of their souls. Later in the parable of the pounds, we find a certain circumstance that is not found in the parable of the talents. The citizens came to hate this noble man and sent an embassy after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Here is a characteristic that reminds us of an event from the life of Archelaus on his way to Rome. The Jews who hated him sent an embassy of 50 people to Rome to beg that he, be, that he not be confirmed as king of Judea, but their efforts were fruitless. As it refers to the Lord Jesus Christ, this detail reminds us of how the Jewish people rejected him as their Messiah, but also without purpose because he remained the king and judge of the whole world, who will demand an account from his slaves and will punish those who refuse to accept his authority. In both parables, the return of the Lord is reminiscent of the second coming of Christ, when every person will have to give an account at the dread judgment of how he used those external good things given him by God. Those who multiply their pounds and talents will be worthy of praise and will, and will receive each according to his zeal. The one who hid his pound or talent will be punished as a wicked servant who did not want to labor with those benefits of God's goodness in whom the grace of God remained without fruit. The accusation of the lazy servant that his master is cruel is merely a typical self-justification of the sinner who lost his feeling of being a son of God due to his, own sinf due to his sinfulness. Such a sinner only imagines God to be cruel and unfair. Whoever uses his gifts well will increase them. A slothful and careless person will lose even what he has already. Therefore, to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. The parable of the pounds finish with the threat of a harsh punishment to the Jewish nation for their not accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah. After finishing the parable, the Lord continued on his way to Jerusalem. And that is the end of this section. And again, did your grace have any thoughts to share? Yes, um, these two parables from uh, two different evangelists are, are basically the same parable. And perhaps they were told with um, small differences, perhaps. Um, each um, evangelist remembered to write down different aspects of the parable. Uh, in one of the parables, the the Lord that's going away, the the um, uh, big rich man, uh, he divides up all his possessions, and I think all these possessions is equal to the fact that we have everything we need um to be saved uh and the salvation uh comes from the church so the church was provided for us um, and if we want to say that the birth of the church was pentecost this is what we usually speak about so having the church we have all the means to be saved no one can say there's no way for me to be saved uh Archbishop Averke points out that um, these people didn't want to be laid, we didn't want to, to labor. Uh, each one of them, uh, except the last one in, in the parable of the talents, uh, he produces 
another time of what he was given. In other words, uh, his gifts are multiplied one over. Um, the only one is the one that out of fear, and this is not a godly fear, he doesn't um, want to labor and he doesn't want to lose uh, that little that he thinks he has. Uh, so the Christian is the person that gives all to gain all. Uh, and without labor, um, nothing can come about. Uh, an ancient quote says that um, uh, good things have brought through labor. So uh, the Christian can't be afraid of laboring in whatever ways and in all ways. Um, we labor through fasting, we labor through prayer, we labor through doing good works. Uh, any kind of asceticism, both bodily, physical asceticism, and spiritual asceticism, all those are ways we labor uh, and we will produce fruit from that. And um, we have all we need because Christ has given us, the church has given us salvation. Is there, I had a thought reading this, but I, I was thinking of people who are discontent with who their bishop or their priest is. When, when Archbishop Averki is describing how the Jews went to, to Rome to protest against the, um, um, whoever it was that was the supposed to be become their king and it was, it was fruitless. And um, likewise, the Jews who didn't accept Christ and Messiah, ultimately it's, it's like beyond fruitless for them because like it or not, Christ is the, the God of all and he will judge all people. Um, but I was wondering if there is some sort of link between this parable and um, being content or discontent with who the bishops of our church are and who the pastors of our church are. There is um, um, a likeness in them. Yeah, and especially people that don't want to labor, I've noticed are the ones with the most complaint about um, how they're being served spiritually. Um, I've heard people say that, oh, I want to confess to someone uh, that's a good confessor, as in a good spiritual father. Uh, we don't consider that much, though, how much, or maybe I'm not talking about myself, but in, in general about a, a layman, how, how good they are at confessing their sins, how good they are at opening their soul is more, has more to do with um, the re remedy that they receive than how good the confessor is. Of course, I would say that different people and different uh, spiritual fathers have different gifts, but what is our labor? And that's something uh, we don't uh, look to. I remember in the, the very old days of, um, the True Orthodox Church of Greece when I was uh, going to some remote places that um, weren't served that often. Uh, people were complaining that, you know, we need a priest. And I'm looking at this whole parish and I'm saying, what, uh, what were your fruits? Did you try and uh, send any of your children uh, to become leaders in your church, or did you try and keep them away from everything spiritual and just have a liturgy on Sunday? And you're paying the price that your your community um, wasn't able to bear fruit and have clergymen. Is this um, a general temptation for for Orthodox Christians in these times, that's better to to view the church and to view pastors as people that serve us rather than people that we serve or, or, as, or the church is something that we serve. Um, obviously, to, to become a pastor is to become a servant to others. Um, but is there, a, is there in, in general, in these times, uh, are Orthodox Christians not understanding the relationship that they have with the church and the pastors of the church? 
I think someone would have to be a clergyman for a little while to understand um, how much of an ascetical feat it is today um, to serve and not to expect any reward. And I'm talking here about spiritual rewards. I'm not talking about uh, our people paying us a salary. Um, but um, I'm often, um, uh, not often, this is the story of my life, I'm disappointed in what people um, end up doing. In other words, they have all their problems and they're with the clergyman, gimme, gimme, gimme. But um, they're like that man in the gospel who was forgiven his great debt by, by the master, but then went out and grabbed his fellow servant and said, you owe me so much and you'll be in the jail until you pay it off. Uh, these are the people of our times. So um, yes, we don't think, what do I owe to the church? What do I owe to my priest? What do I owe to my spiritual father? What do I owe to my bishop? Not again, and when I'm not talking monetarily now, uh, I'm talking what do I owe to the work that, that they're um, accomplishing, and have I helped them to accomplish uh, the work of the church, or have I been an impediment for them uh, to fulfill that work of the church? Uh, there's someone who who sometimes has. Um, provided um, some insights into things, some written works. Uh, and to me, it's like receiving, I don't know what, it's like receiving the greatest gift because um, it, it's a fruit of our, our church. And uh, they're not expecting everything on a platter to them, but rather uh, they're striving uh, to give back to the church. When was the last time Your Grace has ever heard someone come up to Your Grace and say, what projects or what work can I help the church with? That's, that's uh, uh, not a very uh, uh, usual event. Um, okay, I've, I've heard it in the last year at least, but um, for the most part, it's things that don't people don't think about, and I realize that everybody is pressured by t today's life, pressured with their families, pressured with this, pressured with that, but what can I do for the church? What can I do for Christ? Uh, how can I stand by the clergy? Is not something that's in the mind of most faithful. Um, what am I doing in this whole um, plan of salvation? Uh, like I said, it's the give me attitude. I want, I want, I want, I need. And I think any clergyman that's God-fearing, even to the least, will want to, to step in, want to step in when someone is having marital problems, want to help um, uh, anyone in any kind of problem that they have in our flock. And I think that our clergymen devote um, a lot of time, and for the most part, our clergymen, our clergymen, are um, laborers in the the vineyard of the Lord uh, without any um, paycheck or uh, something that they can rely on. So, so the least that people could do is try and do the same. Try and work. Uh, for the church, just for working for the church. Would that bear, would that approach this, but it bear more fruit for a person individually in terms of the grace that they receive? Would it bear more fruit for them to, instead of have, say, like, okay, I, I, I have this idea, I want to do it for the church. Would it, would it be better for that person to, to actually, instead of, okay, I've got this idea to, to bake, um, cookies for for our, um, for all of our parishioners on on Sundays for the next six months would it be better for them to that sounds to me like an awesome thing to do but w would it be better for that person to actually go up and ask the the priest hey like I, well, I've got this idea but is there anything that you would that would be better for me to do than this um, is that the way that they should have I'm trying to 
Does your race kind of understand what I'm getting at? I'm wondering how someone should approach this. Yeah. What, what you're talking about. Uh, we had a case where maybe two cases by the same person uh, that want, got it into their head that they were going to donate to the church something quite expensive. With that money, we could have done what was really needed in the church, but no, they wanted to do this particular thing, which was not needed, not necessary. And uh, a great uh, amount of money to something that basically um, was not what what the church building needed at that time. So um, in a lot of ways, it would be best to to ask, what does the church need? What can I provide? Whether uh, that's with helping with anything. Hopefully I can say in passing, if anyone does want to help the church, uh, sorry, let me, before I even say this, so is it kind of like we discussed before, we were discussing the um, Christ in the, in the home of Mary and Martha and how it's better so the if it's it's okay it's perfectly fine if you're told to go and do something um which is perceived as a non-spiritual activity at the expense of a spiritual activity so for example the there might be a re, uh, there might be a, a catechetical reading happening in the church and the priest or someone someone there in authority comes up to one of the laymen and says can you please like um quickly go to the corner and and get this thing that we need for for whatever um for after the service or or during the service um like it, it might be can you please go and get um some flowers for us to to put in front of this icon um that person if they're if they're doing that under obedience is not going to lose any of the grace that the other people in the church have for, for being there and, and listening to the words of of uh, the, the catechesis um but i asked your grace like but there's a difference between someone self willfully choosing to do those sorts of things versus being told to do them and it was your grace said i sorry i don't want to put words in your grace's mouth but my understanding was that yes, like it's it's good for whoever's in authority to kind of be like the mind, the brain of of the group that's there. And so if they're coordinating everything and everyone's like doing what they're supposed to be doing, that this is this is good and this is grace filled. Am I correct so far in what I've said, Desvada? Correct. Um, we don't have spiritual eyes, and if we had spiritual eyes, I think we would see that even the person that collects the garbage of the church um, is serving Christ. Uh, we have in the gospel um, the example of Martha and Maria, the two sisters, Martha and Mary. Um, Mary is the uh, hesychast kind of uh, person. She sits and listens to the word of the Lord. And Christ does praise her, saying that it's greater. But the fathers talking about this say that uh, Mary is glorified through Martha. In other words, if Martha wasn't there to do all this, the manual work, there could have been no time for anyone to sit at the feet of Christ. So both of them um, have a reward from God. Uh, the problem here was that Martha was perturbed that Mary wasn't helping her, but Mary had need of, of, of something else. She had need of listening to the Lord at that point. So uh, we can't say that just the person who's just going to do spiritual things uh, is the person to be saved. Just like in a monastery, there are uh, always work. There's We have to cook. We have to do some kind of cleaning. We have to do... Um, some kind of handicraft to let us live. So uh, everything is not praying, uh, is there. Um, in order to keep the whole system going, uh, does the monk or the nun who's um, cooking receive uh, a blessing? Does this one receive a blessing? Does that one? Yes, they are all very much a part of it. And we have um, in services, we commemorate 
um, those brothers that are missing and, and those that are working and those that have worked because someone might have worked uh, during uh, another time and then be resting during the service. But that person is again in his service because he worked um, at a time when the other monks or nuns weren't working and then at the particular moment he needs to rest. So uh, we have to see everything in the church. And I brought the example of one manus, but everything in the whole church as a communal effort um, to get the uh, the word of God uh, given out to the people of God. Um, thank you, Vespada. And so, my my question is: so, if if we if we say that on the minute level, that in a in a parish, that the mind who organizes the good works of everyone in the parish should be whoever's the rector there. Um, does does the same apply to the church? So if anyone wants to do good works for the church, is the simply the best thing for them to do to to go and ask whoever's in charge, like what 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 I want to do things, like I want to help. I have this time, I have this this resources that I that I'm capable of of giving. And what would you like me to do? Is that the best way to approach it, Despita, so that it's everything is well ordered and organized by the person who's um who's overseeing everything and trying to lead everyone to salvation. That would be so beautiful if people did that. Um, that's not what's going on for the most part, but um, that would be the um, the ideal that we would be doing in church. I can do this. Um, what would you suggest that I do? And on the other side, if if someone doesn't have that approach, uh, but and they they might put a lot of time and money effort into their particular work that they consider is for Christ and for the church, but if they haven't done it with a blessing, I'm thinking that this can cause very 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 serious harm. So if you if you have this idea that you know, and that I've got so much time, so much resources that I can devote to doing what I consider good things, but you don't, you don't take them to someone in authority and, and get a blessing and guidance on them. Can they be very, very catastrophic both for yourself and for others, Despita? Both in a practical sense and in a spiritual sense, those things are, are risky. In a practical sense, if you're doing something that's either not producing fruit are producing bad fruit, uh, then in a practical sense, we don't need it. In a spiritual sense, how do we expect God to bless the work of our hands if there was something done without a blessing, without um, someone advising us that this is what um, God wants of us? Uh, we shouldn't be sure of ourselves and say, oh, well, I know this is what God wants, because um, we don't know. I've often mentioned uh, Abbas Paraskevi, who used to, as then a, a very old nun and an abbess, who uh, used to ask me, who was a very fresh priest at that, what should we do with this? What should we do about this? And she kept reassuring me because I said, why are you asking me? You know much better about this. She kept reassuring me that we need to ask someone in order for God to bless every single work. Ask um, advice, ask, um, ask your staff, as uh, she would say herself. I think it was the saying, if you, if you don't have anyone to ask for advice, ask your staff. Is that correct, Ms. Peter? Exactly. This next section is called The Raising of Lazarus, and it references the Gospel of St. John, chapter 11, verses 1 to 46. Now there was a certain sick man, Lazarus of Bethany, of the village of Mary and her sister Martha, and it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with perfumed ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And after Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not to death, but for the glory of God, 
in order that the Son of God might be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he heard, therefore, that he is sick, then indeed he remained in the place which he was for two days. Then after this he saith to his disciples, Let us go unto Judea again. The disciples say to him, Rabbi, just now the Jews were seeking to stone thee, and goest thou there again? Jesus answered, There are twelve hours in the day, are there not? If any one walk about in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if any one walk about in the night, he stumbleth, because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after this he saith to them, Our friend Lazarus hath fallen asleep, but I go that I might awaken him. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he hath fallen asleep, he shall recover. But Jesus had spoken about his death, but they thought that he spoke about taking rest in sleep. Therefore Jesus then said to them openly, Lazarus died. And I rejoice on your account that I was not there, in order that ye might believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, the one who was called Didymos, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we might die with him. Then after Jesus came, he found that he already had been in the sepulchre four days. Now Bethany was nigh to Jerusalem, about fifteen stadia away. And many of the Jews had come to join the woman around Martha and Mary in order that they might console them concerning their brother. Then Martha, when she heard that Jesus is coming, went to meet him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if thou wert here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatsoever thou thyself shall ask of God, God will give it to thee. Jesus saith to her, Thy brother shall rise up. Martha saith to him, I know that he shall rise up in the resurrection in the, in the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believeth in me, though he die, he shall live. And everyone who, who liveth and believeth in me, in no wise shall ever die. Believest thou this? She saith to him, Yea, Lord, I have believed that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, who cometh into the world. And after she said these things, she went away and called Mary, her sister, secretly, and saith, The teacher is present and calleth thee. And the latter, when she heard, rose up quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was in the place where Martha went to meet him. The Jews then, who were with her in the house and consoling her, after they saw that Mary quickly rose up and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the sepulchre that she might weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if thou wert here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the, and the Jews who came down with her weeping, he rebuked his deep feelings in the spirit and troubled himself and said, Where have ye laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews were saying, Behold, but sorry, behold how he was loving him. But some of them said, Was not this one Abel, who opened the eyes of the blind, to have caused that this one should not die? Then Jesus, again rebuking his deep feelings in himself, cometh to the sepulchre. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying upon it. Jesus saith, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the one who was dead, saith to him, Lord, already he stinketh, for it is the fourth day. Jesus saith to her, I said to thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God, did I not? Then they took away the stone where the dead one was laid. And Jesus lifted his eyes upwards and said, Father, I give thanks to thee that thou heardest me, but I know that thou hearest me always. But on account of the crowd which stood around, I said it, that they might believe that thou didst send me forth. And after he said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the one who was dead came forth, his feet and hands having been bound with grave clothes, and his face had been bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith to him, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw, that Jesus, and saw what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus did. And this is Archbishop of Erkey. Only St. John tells of this event. 
While the Lord was still in Perea, he received news of the illness of his dear friend Lazarus, who lived in Bethany with his sisters Martha and Mary. This family was especially close to the Lord, and he often visited them to rest from the noise of the crowds and the antagonism and the antagonism of his enemies during his pilgrimages to Jerusalem. The sisters sent word to the Lord, He whom you love is sick, hoping that the Lord himself would hurry to them in order to heal the sick man. But the Lord not only did not hurry, but even purposely remained in the same place where he was another where he was another two days, saying, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. The Lord knew that Lazarus would die, and if he said that the illness would not result in his death, that was because he intended to resurrect him. Only two days later, when Lazarus was already dead, did the Lord say to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The Lord did not say Bethany, but Judea, because that was the goal of their journey, in order to bring to the fore the hidden thought in their hearts about the danger awaiting him in Judea. Through, through this, the Lord wanted to strengthen in the disciples the thought of the necessity and thus the inevitability of the suffering and death of their teacher. And the disciples did react with fear for him, reminding him that just a short time ago the Jews wanted to stone him in Jerusalem. The Lord answers their fear with an allegory taken from his surroundings. It was most likely early in the morning as the sun was rising. Consequently, they had 12 hours for their journey. During these 12 hours, travel along the roads would be considered safe. It would only become dangerous if they had to travel after the setting of the sun or at night. But there was no need to do this because their travel to Bethany would, would take less than a day. <clears throat> In the spiritual sense, this means that the name of our earth that sorry, in the spiritual sense, this means that the time of our earthly life is determined by God's will. And so while we live, we can go along the path at our feet without fear and do the work to which we are called. We are safe, for God's will protects us from all dangers, as the light of the sun protects those who walk during the day. There would be a danger if, during our work, night would catch us. That is, if we continued to work beyond the time allotted to us, contrary to God's will, then we would be in danger of stumbling on the road. In reference to Jesus Christ, this means that the life and work of the Lord Jesus Christ would not finish earlier than its allotted time, and so the disciples should not be afraid of the dangers awaiting him. By completing his ministry in the light of the will of God, in, in the light of the will of God, the God-man could not be subjected to unexpected danger. I'll, say, I'll read that again. By completing his ministry in the light of the will of God, the God-man could not be subjected to unexpected danger. Having explained this, the Lord indicated the immediate purpose of their going toward Judea. Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I might wake him up. The Lord called Lazarus' death, Lazarus's death sleep as he, as he did in certain other situations. For Lazarus, death truly was like sleep because it was so short. The disciples did not understand that the Lord was speaking of Lazarus's death, remembering his previous words that his illness was not deadly. They thought that the Lord would come and miraculously heal him. Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. They said, they said this probably to, to, dis, to disabuse him of his notion to go to Judea. There is no need to go since the sickness took a turn for the better. Then the Lord, putting aside any arguments concerning their journey, desiring to underline the necessity of traveling to Judea, said clearly, Lazarus is dead. He also added that he was joyful for the disciples that he was not in Bethany when Lazarus was sick, since a simple healing would not strengthen their faith in him as much as the forthcoming great miracle of raising him from the dead. Cutting off the conversation regarding their fears definitively, the Lord said, let us go to him. While their wavering was quashed, their fears did not dissipate, and one of them, Thomas, called Didymos, which means twin, expressed this fear in a very moving way. Let us also go that we may die with him. In other words, if we cannot dissuade him from this journey, will we leave him to, will, will we leave him to it alone? Let us also go to die with him. When they approached Bethany, it became clear that Lazarus was already dead for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, about half an hour's about half an hour's walk. This detail is given by Saint John in order to in order to explain why so many people were in Martha and Mary's house, despite Bethany being a very small village. Martha, the sister with a much with a much livelier character, when she heard of the Lord's coming, hurried to meet him, 
without even telling her sister about it, because Mary was at home in great sorrow, accepting the condolences of those who came to mourn with her for her brother. With sorrow, she said, not rebuking the Lord, only expressing her regret that it happened in this way. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Her faith in the Lord, however, made her sure that even now, that even now not all was lost, and maybe a miracle could be, could be performed, although she does not say this openly, rather saying, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. To this the Lord gives her a straight answer, your brother will rise again. Almost as if to check herself to see if she understood him correctly, and desiring the Lord to qualify his answer and help her clearly understand which resurrection he referred to, the miracle that he intended to perform now, or the, the miracle that he intended to perform now, or the general resurrection of the dead at the end of the world, Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. <clears throat> Martha th thus expressed her faith that God will, would fulfill any petition of Jesus. Consequently, she did not yet have faith in Jesus himself as the all-powerful Son of God. Therefore, the Lord raises her to, the, to this higher faith, concentrating her faith on his own person, saying, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. The meaning of these words is the following. In me is the source of resurrection and eternal life. And so if I want to resurrect your brother now, I can do so even before the general resurrection. Do you believe this? He asks her and receives an affirmative answer that she believes in him as the Messiah Christ who came into the world. Then, urged by the Lord, Martha went to call her sister Mary to bring her also to him. Since she told Mary in secret, and the Jews mourning with her did not know where she was going, they went with her, thinking that she was going to the tomb of Lazarus to mourn there. Mary fell at Jesus' feet with tears, uttering the same words as Martha. The Lord groaned in the spirit and was troubled. See, uh, sorry. The Lord groaned in the spirit and was troubled, seeing, much, seeing such sorrow at Lazarus's death. Bishop Michael believes that this sorrow and disturbance in Christ's heart was inspired by the presence of the Jews who were ritually mourning without sincerity and who were all filled with hatred against him who was planning to perform this great miracle. He wanted to perform this miracle to give his enemies every chance to repent and believe in him before his passion. But instead of that, they only increased in their hatred and definitively condemned him, finally with the death sentence. Having overcome his inner turmoil, the Lord asked, Where have you laid him? The question was directed at the sister. Blessed Augustine says, The God-man knew where Lazarus was buried, but since he was communicating with people, he spoke as a man. The sisters answered, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. This, of course, is an expression of his human nature. The evangelist John later writes of the impression that these tears made on those who were there. They were moved while others said with anger in their hearts, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Their rationale is this. If he could have prevented Lazarus's death, he would have since he loved him, but he could not and therefore he weeps. Again, putting down within himself his sorrow at the hatred of the Jews, the Lord came to the tomb of Lazarus and told them to remove the stone. Tombs in Palestine are built in the form of a cave whose entrance is blocked with a large stone. Opening such caves is allowed only in extreme cases and only soon after the burial, not four days afterward when the body was already rotting. In the warm climate of Palestine, the rotting of bodies after death begins very quickly which is why the Jews buried their dead on the same day as their death. The rod on the fourth day could be so far advanced that even faithful Martha could not stop herself from contradicting the Lord. Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Reminding Martha of his previous words, the Lord said, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? When the stone was rolled away, the Lord raised his eyes to the heaven and prayed, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Knowing that his enemies ascribed his miraculous power to the demons, the Lord wanted to show with his prayer that he performs miracles through, uh, through power of his oneness with God the Father. The soul of Lazarus returned to his body, and the Lord exclaimed in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. 
the loud voice here is an expression of his strong will, which is sure that that it command that its commands will be heeded, or it is the voice intended to wake a sleeper. To the miracle of the resurrection, another uh, sorry. To the miracle of the resurrection, another miracle was added. Lazarus, though tied hand and foot in a burial shroud, came out of the cave himself. After which the Lord commanded him to be untied. The fine details given in this account bear witness to the fact that St. John the Evangelist was there to see the miracle. As a result of the miracle, the usual division occurred among the Jews. Many believed, but others went to the Pharisees, the worst of the Lord's enemies, with evil feelings and intentions, in order to tell them of what had just occurred. And that's the end of this section. Did we have any thoughts or questions on this section? I thought it was interesting that it was mentioned twice in the text that uh, he rebuked the feelings deeply within himself. But I think the commentary kind of referred to that about the that the unbelief of the Jews was was uh, what he wept most about during that. Yeah, and I wonder, like with our with our pastors, they're responsible for shepherding us to the heavenly kingdom and when uh when they're disappointed with us or not 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 pleased with us i wonder how much of that is because we're shooting ourselves in the foot spiritually i'd um often wondered why jesus wept at, at lazarus's death when he knew that he was going to um, bring him back resurrect him um, but that that explains it um, and yeah, I never really understood that, but now it's much clearer. So it's very sad that Jesus wept because basically the Jews hated him so much, his own people hated him. This next section is the decision of the Sanhedrin to kill the Lord Jesus Christ, and it references. The next verses from the Gospel of St. John, which are chapter 11, verses 47 to 57. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together for a session of the Sanhedrin and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is doing many signs. If we should let him die thus alone, all will believe in him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and the nation. But a certain one of them, Caiaphas, being a high priest of that year, said to them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is, it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. But he said, he said this not of himself, but being high priest that year, sorry, but he said that not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but that he also should gather together into one the children of God who have been scattered abroad. Then from that day they took counsel together among themselves in order that they might put him to death. Jesus, therefore, was no longer walking openly among the Jews, but went away from that place into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and there he stayed with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up to Jerusalem, and many went up to Jerusalem out of the country before the Passover in order that they might purify themselves. Then were they seeking Jesus and were speaking with one another as they stood in the temple. What, what think ye, that he will come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone should know where he is, he should make it known in order that they might lay hold of him. And this is Archbishop of Erke. News of the miracle had such a disturbing effect on the enemies of the Lord that the high priests and Pharisees immediately called a special session of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of the Jews. In their own company, they were not afraid to speak completely openly, and so immediately they raised the question, what should be done to preserve their power and their influence over the people? They acknowledged the miracles of the Lord as authentic miracles, but they expressed fear that a national uprising might be the, res might be the result, and the Romans might use that as an excuse to destroy what little independence the Jews had. The fatality of their reasoning was apparent. They did, not, they did not accept the Lord as the Messiah since he did not correspond to their twisted ideas about the Messiah, but still expressed fear that he could stand at the head of, the, of an insurrection and through this bring an even greater calamity to the whole Jewish nation. 
one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, this does not mean that the high priests were only chosen for a year, but this is in brackets. This does not mean that the high priests were only chosen for a year, but only shows that under Roman rule, high priests were frequently changed by the rulers of Judea, in bracket, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. In other words, they must prevent this dangerous situation of an, of an insurrection against Rome with Jesus at the head by killing Jesus. Here Caiaphas put on the mask of a zealot for the good of the nation and at the same time finds a nationalistic political consideration as an excuse for their conspiring to murder. The evangelist John indicates that these words were an involuntary prophecy by Caiaphas about the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ had to die for the people, that is, to suffer for mankind to redeem them. The high priest, as the messengers of the will of God, sorry, the high priests, as the messengers of the will of God, were mediators between God and men. And, and in this capacity, they could even prophesy unwillingly, which is exactly what happened even with such a high priest as Caiaphas, except that Caiaphas was only speaking of the Hebrew nation, while Christ died for the salvation and gathering into one church of both Jews and Gentiles as children of God who were scattered abroad. And so they made an official decision to kill Jesus and gave an order that he be taken. When Jesus found out about the, convi about the conviction, he left Bethany to go to Ephraim near the desert of Jericho, for his, for his hour to suffer had not yet come. As a true Paschal lamb, he had to die on the Passover, triumphantly, not secretly, as the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin evidently hoped to kill him, fearing the people. And that's the end of this section. And again, did we have any thoughts or questions on this section? I thought it was always interesting that Caiaphas made this prophecy and and kind of unknowingly uh, what he what he was thinking the prophecy went beyond what he was thinking but he but he uttered it and how God used you know even him and his fallenness to still uh, bring about a prophecy that would come true this next section is called the dinner in Bethany at the home of Lazarus and it references Again, so continuing the Gospel of St. John, chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was who had died, whom he raised from the dead. So they made a supper for him there, and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at table with him. Then Mary, having taken a pound of very precious perfumed ointment of pure spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with, with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the perfumed ointment. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who was about to deliver him up, saith, Why was this perfumed ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? But he said this, not that he was caring for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and was taking away what was put in it. Then Jesus said, "Let her alone, for the day of my laying out for burial hath she, for the day of my laying out for burial hath she kept it. For ye have the poor among yourselves always, but me ye have ye have not always." A great crowd of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not because of Jesus only, but also in order that they might see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests took counsel that they might put to death Lazarus also, because by reason of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. And this is Archbishop of Erke. This dinner was, was prepared for the Lord six days before the Passover and is, not the same dinner as, and is not the same dinner as the one described by the first two evangelists, St. Matthew and St. Mark, which occurred two days before the Passover in the house of Simon the leper. Of course, it was held in the house of Lazarus, who was raised from the dead. This is made obvious by the fact that Martha was serving and Lazarus himself was one of those at the table. At this dinner, Mary anointed the feet of the Lord with precious myrrh, while at the other dinner described by the first two evangelists, the Lord's head was anointed with myrrh by a certain woman who was a sinner, according to tradition, which is remembered in services of Great and Holy Wednesday when this anointing is commemorated. According to the evangelist John, only Judas rebuked Mary regarding the cost of the myrrh, while in Matthew and Mark, all the disciples do. There is nothing strange in the possibility that the Lord was twice anointed. 
Mary did this from a sense of deep gratitude for the resurrection of her brother, while the sinful woman did this as a sign of her repentance, for which she was promised a great reward. Mary had this myrrh most likely left over from the burial of her brother Lazarus, as if she had known to save some for a, from, with a prophetic foreknowledge. The entry of the Lord into Jerusalem. So it references all four Gospels. So starting with the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. And when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Beth, Beth, Bethphage toward the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent forth two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village, the one opposite you, and straightway you shall find an ass which hath been tied, and a colt and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone should say anything to you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. Now all this came to pass in order that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh to thee meek, and mounted on an ass, and a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And the disciples went and did even as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put their garments upon them. And he sat down upon them, and the greater part of the crowd spread their garments in the way, and others were cutting branches from the trees and were strewing them in the way. And the crowds, those going before and those following, were crying out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And after he entered into Jerusalem, all the city was shaken, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is Jesus the prophet, the one from Nazareth of Galilee. And then next, the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. And when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, toward the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of, his, two of his disciples and said to them, Go ye into the village, the one opposite you, and straightway as ye enter into it, ye shall find a colt which hath been tied, on which no man hath sat. Loose it and bring it, and if anyone should say to you, Why do ye do this? Say, The Lord hath need of it, and straightway he will, and straightway he will, he will send it here. And they departed and found the colt which was tied at the door outside in the street, and they loose it. And some of those who stood there began saying to them, What are ye doing loosing the colt? And they spoke to them even as Jesus commanded them, and they permitted them. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments upon it, and he sat upon it. And many spread their garments in the way, and others were cutting leafy branches from the trees and strewing them in the way. And those going before and those following were crying out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David, which cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And after he looked about for himself at all things, as it was already the evening hour, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And then the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 19 verses 29 to 44 and it came to pass as he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany toward the mount called the Mount of Olives he sent forth two of his disciples saying go ye into the village opposite you in which as ye enter ye shall find a colt which hath been tied on which no man ever yet sat loose it and bring it and if anyone ask you why do ye loose it thus shall you say to him because the Lord hath need of it and after they departed, they who were sent, they who were sent found all even as he said to them. And as they loosed the colt, the masters of it said to them, Why do ye loose a colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of it. And they led it to Jesus. And having cast their own garments upon the colt, they put Jesus upon it. And as he went, they were spreading under him their garments in the way. And when he drew near, already at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began rejoicing and to, be, and to be praising God with a loud voice for all the works of power which they saw, saying, Blessed is the King who cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from the, from the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said to them, I say to you that if these should keep silent, the stones will cry out. And as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if thou knewest even if thou knewest even thou and at least in this thy day the things for thy peace but now it is hidden from thine eyes 
for the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall put a rampart around thee and encompass thee and contain thee on every side and dash to the ground thee and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee a stone upon a stone because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation and then next the gospel of saint john verses 12 sorry chapter 12 verses 12 to 19. On the morrow a great crowd which came to the on the morrow a great crowd which came to the feast after they heard that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem took the palm branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and were crying hosanna blessed is he who cometh in the name of the lord the king of israel and Jesus having found a young ass sat upon it even as it is written cease fearing o daughter of sion behold thy king cometh sitting on a colt of an ass but the disciples knew not these things at the first but when jesus but when jesus was glorified then they remembered that these things were written in reference to him and that these things they did to him then the crowd that was with him when he called lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead bore witness on this account the crowd also went to meet him because it heard that he had done this sign the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Observe ye that ye profit nothing. Observe ye that ye profit nothing. Behold, the world hath gone away from him. And that's uh, and this is Archbishop Averki. The Lord Jesus Christ now walked to Jerusalem in order to accomplish all that was written of him as the Messiah by the prophets. He went in order to drink the cup of redemptive suffering, to give his soul for the redemption of many, and later to enter into his glory. Therefore, in contrast to how he entered Jerusalem the last time, it behooved him to make his final entry into Jerusalem in full triumph. The first three evangelists, St. Matthew, St. Mark, and St. Luke, give us certain details that preface the triumphant entry. When the Lord and his disciples, surrounded by many people who accompanied him from Bethany and whom they met along the way, approached the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples into the village ahead of them with the instruction to bring back a female donkey and her young colt. The Mount of Olives was named so because it was co covered in olive trees. It is found east of Jerusalem and is separated by a river which almost completely dried up during the summer. On the western slope of the river, the one facing Jerusalem, there was a garden called Gethsemane. On the eastern slope, there were two villages called Bethphage and Bethany. From the top of the Mount of Olives, one could see all of Jerusalem. From Bethany, two roads led to Jerusalem. One went around the Mount on the south, the other went over the summit, this latter of which was shorter, though more difficult and strenuous. In Palestine, there were few horses and those were used exclusively by soldiers for wartime. For household work and travel, donkeys, mules, and camels were used. To sit on a horse was a sign of war. To sit on a mule or a donkey was a symbol of peace. In peaceful times, both kings and national leaders rode around on the more domestic animals. Thus, the entry of the Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem on a donkey was a sign of peace. The king of peace was coming to his capital on a donkey, the symbol of peace. It is remarkable that the owner of the donkey and her colt, after hearing the request of the Lord, immediately gave him his animals when the apostles told him for whom they were taking them. Noting the unusual nature of this fact, St. John Chrysostom said, The Lord wanted to let them know that he could easily overcome the stubborn Jews when they came to seize him and force them to be silent. However, he did not want to do this. The evangelist Matthew and John indicate that this was the fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah, which they cite in truncated form uh, and which in its fullness reads thus, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having, he is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Ze Zechariah uh, chapter 9, verse 9. This prophecy is similar to Isaiah 62, from which Matthew takes the beginning of his rendition of the prophecy, say to the daughter of Sion, surely your salvation is coming. Understanding the significance of this moment, the apostles themselves tried to decorate this procession with pomp. They covered the donkey and her colt with their outer clothing, which was intended to mimic the gold fabric that would decorate a king's horse. 
and the Lord sat on the clothing, riding on the colt, as we see in Mark, as we see in Mark, Luke, and John, with the donkey walking nearby. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road, following the example of the disciples, while others, who did not have outer robes due to their poverty, cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road, in order to make the road softer and more comfortable for the colt, giving honour to the one sitting astride it. By taking all four evangelical accounts together, one can draw the following picture. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent, of, the descent of the Mount of Olives, when he was coming to the place where Jerusalem would have been most visible, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen and the salvation of the world affected by the Christ. St. John adds the following words, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. Thus two, two crowds came together. One was coming from Bethany with Christ. The other was coming from Jerusalem to meet him. The, the view of Jerusalem in all its glory inspired joy in this mass of people, which was expressed in their loud exclamations, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna literally means save or grant, or grant salvation. This exclamation was used as an expression of joy and piety and glorification. Hosanna in the highest is a, is a request that the same joyful expressions be uttered for the sake of the King of Israel in the heavens. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord means worthy of blessing and glory is the one who comes from the Lord with his authority as the King's representative king's representatives come bearing all the authority and power of the king who sent them the evangelist mark also adds another exclamation blessed is the kingdom of our father david that comes in the name of the lord the kingdom of david was to be restored by the messiah whose throne would remain for eternity and whose power would spread over all the nations in these words the sons of israel glorified christ who came to restore this kingdom of david St. Luke adds another one, peace in heaven, meaning let all true spiritual good and eternal salvation come down from heaven. St. John explains that the reason for this great joy in meeting the Lord was the resurrection of Lazarus, while St. Luke indicates all the miracles performed by him. In this event, the Holy Church sees a special providence of God and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. From this point of view, one can understand the Lord's answer given to the hateful counsel of the Pharisees, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. If these, if, these, if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. In other words, this glorification of the Messiah was placed in the hearts and mouths of the people by God himself. And if someone tried to act against God's will in this, the soulless stones would replace the people in glorifying the Lord. In these words, the church sees also a metaphorical indication of the pagans who were at first stone-hearted but later replaced Israel, who rejected Christ. The same meaning can be applied to the answer the Lord gives the Pharisees in the account given by Matthew when they were angry that the, that the Jews were exclaiming in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and, and nursing infants that you have perfected praise? In other words, the Lord tells the Pharisees that God himself prepared the praise uh, to, to come from the mouths of children and suckling babes. When the Lord saw the city, as St. Luke tells us, he began to weep on its account, knowing of its imminent destruction. It is interesting to note that in AD 70, the Romans, when they began the siege of Jerusalem, set up their camp on the same place on the Mount of Olives where Christ was standing at that moment. And the siege began not long before Passover that year. If you had known, as I do, even you, especially in this your day or or in the time of your visitation, the things that make the things that make for your peace, that is, those things that are for your salvation. But now they are hidden from your eyes. That is, you close your eyes stubbornly to not see that by rejecting me you are preparing your own destruction. You did not know the time of your visitation, the time when the Lord was merciful to you and called you to salvation through the Messiah, whom you rejected instead of following. St. Matthew witnesses that when he went into, into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. So great was the impression of this triumphant entry.